Good morning, good morning. This is me and my wife, Jessica, for this week's Led by the Word. So excited um, that we've made it almost through the Samuels. Like, it's unbelievable. This is, you know, at first I was like, this is going kind of slow, but now that we're a little ways into it, it feels like it's moving really fast. I think it's because stories are progressing faster, and we're no longer in, like, Leviticus. (laughs) Yes, definitely. And there's one part that we're going to cover in here where it just time jumps, quote-unquote, like 40 years. So we're also covering a lot of chronological stuff is happening in this passage. So And do keep in mind, me and Jesse was talking about this, not in podcasts, but just between ourselves. Kings will kind of take you, woo. There's going to be a lot of um, jumping back and forth when you're watching the movie and you have no clue what timeline you're in. Like, is this the beginning, the middle, or the end? You will find that in Second Kings. So that's going to be fun. Yeah. Today is not a fun story. No. Today is far, far from a fun story. Today is a extremely bad family tragedy, a horrific tragedy. Um, so first, let's go in here. I'm going to butcher this name. I believe her name was M- Macca, was the wife, uh, David's wife, and she was the great princess of Syria. And I believe their marriage was political. It kind of leads us to believe that in the Bible. And she comes over here, marries David, and has David's third son, Absalom. So Absalom, (laughs) one of my favorite things they always use to talk about Absalom is chapter 14, verse 25, is depending on your translation of the Bible, he is the most beautiful man in all the land. And it's funny, like they even were, they're like, his skin is perfect. He is absolutely, you go to different Bible translations, one goes as far as to say he is gorgeous. Yeah, and then, like, that next verse, I think it's verse 26, um, talks about how, like, every year he would basically cut off his hair, and it was, like, five pounds of hair, which I know when we go, like, to the hairdressers, we're not like, hey, will you weigh that for me? Five pounds of hair is a lot of hair. Like, it's it's a lot, and you're like, why is it mentioning this? Spoiler alert, it's going to come up. It's an important tool. It is an important tool. (laughs) But, yes, he, apparently, he and his sister and his daughter were very beautiful, is what they said, so... So just as uh, beautiful as he is known as a man, his sister Tamar, which is, you know, we're, we use the name Absalom a lot, but this story revolves a lot around Tamar. Yeah. Um, Tamar was known just as beautiful. Sure. So David and all his polygamy had a bunch of wives, and his eldest son, Amnon? Yes. Or Amnon. Amnon I, I don't know. Something like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. He is always saying how... He has these feelings for Tamar, his Mm half-sister. Feelings you do not want to have for your half-sister. Like, no, no. Very, very, very bad. Um, Well, Jesse, take us through this story. Tell us what happened. Okay, so basically he gets worked up in his mind. And you can just see, like, this is the enemy planning disgusting thoughts, disgusting desires in his life. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to accept this. This is who I am. I really want to get with my half-sister. So he's just, like, getting so sick over it, literally, that he, like, pretty much stops eating, and so he has a friend that I'm definitely going to mention. Friend, friend. It's actually his first cousin, and his name is Jonadab. So Jonadab kind of calls him out and is like, why are you getting so thin? Like, you're not eating. Like, what is your deal? Like, are you are you dying? And so he explains. He's like, listen, I want to be with my half-sister, but I can't for obvious mosaic, common sense, super gross. You know, there's there's reasons I cannot do this. So his friend, John Adab's like, don't worry, I have a plan. So he devises this absolutely evil plan to be like, hey, pretend you're sick, and then just overpower her when she comes in. And he's like, that's a great idea. You ever just like think, oh, that's a great idea? Not a great idea, right? So they go through with this. He disgraces his sister, and then his, basically everyone finds out because they had special clothes that they would wear before they were married, these young ladies. And so she tears her clothes, she's wearing sackcloth, and she's mourning, not quietly, like out in the hall. And so, of course, her older brother Absalom, like, interrogates her and is like, what is going on? You know, and he finds out, and he gets super mad. And I think it's interesting, we're always saying, well, David didn't do anything, David did not do anything. True. David, that we know of, did nothing. It does say he was very wroth over the situation, which I couldn't imagine how angry he would be over your children acting like that. But, um, yeah, he did nothing, but Absalom was like... Oh, like, he had hatred for his brother like no other. I mean, this is his full sister that got taken advantage of. In in that day, a a seed, and you you couldn't imagine what this guy's going through. He had a great love for his sister. Mm -hmm. Um, A seed of hatred and bitterness was planted, and it grows into a whole rebellion. 
So we're like, oh my goodness, it's a seat of anger between two people. And, and I want to show you the sadness of how little revenge satisfies. Truly. So Absalom sets a timeline. He gives his dad two years. He says, you got two years. And he doesn't tell his dad this. No. But he's like, you got two years. I'm going to see if you deal with this. And his dad never does. At least to his satisfaction. It's never dealt he with. He should have. This he is, should have. We could have nipped a lot of things in the bud. I if, think. if David would have stepped up to the role. Sure. So two years later, I still don't understand the significance of this. And now I really, really want to go one. Absalom throws a royal sheep shearing festival. It's where they come together and they shear all the sheep. Mm -hmm. That sounds fun, right? Sure. He takes this opportunity. Uh, Absalom has his own guard. So he's on his property. He's at his house, and David has a guard for him. When the brothers arrive, he tells his guard, slay him. And they kill his half-brother. And it goes from this, you're like, okay, well, he's done his thing. Mm -hmm. Everything should be good. Well, now he runs away. And when he runs away, David mourns for Absalom. Mm -hmm. His complete time of being gone, which surprises me. You think, okay, one kid's messed up. That's brought him great grief. Now, another kid's messed up. It seems it should just be over. Mm -hmm. But no, David is grieving for his son, Absalom, and he's grieving for his son, Absalom. And while he's gone, Absalom is so consumed with anger, so consumed with mm -hmm. hatred that this is now controlling his life. And I, and I want, this is different than my thought in Sunday school, but what I want to talk about today Absalom's name, when David named him, or the mother named him, whoever named him, it means father of peace. And those are two beautiful words, yeah. father and peace. Yeah. He never got to really experience peace much in his life. As far as we know, when this happened, he was a young man. Mm -hmm. When this happened, he wasn't a man of old. He wasn't a man very aged. And from this point forward, Absalom knows nothing of peace. And he definitely wasn't like what I would call an instigator of peace or a peacemaker. No. There was nothing but strife and division with Absalom, and we're about to get into more of that. Um, I do think it's very interesting that a reoccurring theme throughout this entire story is David's heart is going after Absalom. So after he has the eldest brother killed, um, verse 37 and 39 of chapter 13 says, But Absalom fled and went to Tamai, which, by the way, is where his like maternal grandfather is. I think he's the leader there. Mm-hmm. So 39 says, And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. And that is like out of a weird passage. And if you're a young person or maybe you haven't experienced a lot of death in your life, you're like, why was he comforted his son's dead? Because there's closure in death. There's mourning in death. You have resolution in death. With Absalom, it's like, what is he doing? Where, like, is he okay? Like, why is he not here? You know, like he has all these what ifs, whys, these questions. It really, it'll keep you up at night. If you notice that, like a lot of people that struggle with relationships with like their parents or estranged children, they're like, it's almost, it's like you're mourning two deaths almost, you know, it's like he lost two sons, like you said. So, um, it's a reoccurring theme where David's heart wants to go after Absalom. So Joab sees that he's torn up about this. David is torn up about um, Absalom's absence, if you will. So he devised this plan and hires a woman. And he's like, here's what you're going to do. You're going to make up this fake story about, you know, your two sons. One kills the other. And then, you know, the rest of his family wants to kill the murder son and everything. And the woman's like, okay, that sounds great. She goes in and does this, right? And she tells David, she's like, yeah, my one son murdered the other, and now all my family members want him dead. But if he dies, then, like, my husband's legacy is dead and, you know, all this. And she's like, what should I do? And presses him. And David's like, don't worry, your son will be fine, whatever. There was no son. There was this, this, this was fake news. This is a trick parable. So she presses him further, and she's like, well, can I talk to you about something real? Which, by the way, like, that you're coming to the king with that. And he's like, well, go on, you know. And so she's like, is this not, like, the situation with you and Absalom? Like, shouldn't you make this right? So David wises up and is like, Joe, I put you up to this, right? And she's like, <laughs> yeah. So he's like, okay. So his heart is kind of like, yeah, this sounds great. So he has Joab send for Absalom. Now, the way it works is, I know as a kid, I thought, oh, they just all live together in, like, one big palace. They actually had separate houses. Like, a lot of the wives had houses and the sons had houses. So Absalom had his own house where his sister dwelled. So David had Joab bring Absalom back to his own house. But there was this verse, I think it's verse 24. It sounds so weird. It says, and the king said, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. So I'm a, 
I'm making educated guess here. Their houses are not that far away, but he was never in his presence. He never saw his face. So he's like, well, this is good enough. I'll just bring it back. Like, that's not true unity. You know, two people can dwell in the same house and not have unity. So I feel like David was kind of just like not ready maybe to deal with this because, I mean, my feelings would be hurt if, you know, I had a son and he killed the other son like that. We would not and be And it was good. the firstborn. And, you know, God, God shows us this time and time again with mercy and care and love towards us. And Brother Josh Bowman touched on this. It was a prayer service, but he kept saying this reoccurring in prayer. God's mercy is bigger than we can fathom. Right. Amnon done a horrific thing, and you would think the man would be angered, would be tormented, and just want to murder him. But there was still some mercy in there. And David didn't act right. He should have punished. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, David still had a heart towards a son that did a bad thing. And it makes no sense. It's, it's a love we can't fathom. And, and it's the love God had for us. The, the Bible tells us why we were in sin, Christ died for us. And Amnon's on the other side of this, wanting the punishment mm -hmm. and expecting what's rightfully deserved and doesn't get it. So because of David's mistake... This stuff, it just builds and it builds and it grows and it snowballs to such a sad, sad thing that we're going to get to in like 16, 17, and 18. One thing I want to touch on, John 10, 10 becomes a, re a reoccurring verse I use a lot. The enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. I come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And you see both of these trying to work in this story. You see the enemy fighting hard and you see God fighting hard. The saddest thing about God and the enemy fighting in our lives is it comes down to our choice. It does. So when David and his wife name Absalom, they said, this is the father of peace. And you see God fighting. But then you see that calling, you see that purpose, and you see that desire for Absalom's life never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I feel so sad saying that. You see the enemy won with killing, stealing, and destroying Absalom. And it, and it come, what was, the, what was the gentleman's name who was friends with Amnon? Uh, Jonadad. You see it. You see it coming to pass with Jonadad, Amnon, and the chaos and how they submitted to a horrible thing in their lives. And then you see it come into Absalom's life, where he just gives in all this and lives in that. It kind of it's like the oversimplification. If you have ever seen like an older cartoon, and I mean like older as in like the past 15, 20 years, where they have like a little angel on one shoulder and a little demon on the other, and we're like, oh, that's not how it works. But it almost it kind of is. It's like what voice are you gonna let facilitate into your life? And you definitely see Absalom just go off the rails. Like, yes, this was a traumatic event with his sister, but because he let it fester, because he didn't have that forgiveness for his own father. Um, or even his own brother, it just kind of spirals out of control. Like, there's so many little details that I don't think we have time to cover necessarily, but Absalom is constantly trying to facilitate, like, an audience with his father, like, trying to see, like, okay, are you going to make it right? Are you going to make it right? You know? And to a point, I don't know what he expects David to do now that his brother is dead. Um, in verses, like, 29 and 31 area, um, Absalom is trying to reach out to David through Joab. And so Joab is ignoring him, like straight up does not give him an audience. So then Absalom sets his fields on fire. He's like, that'll get his attention. It did. Yeah, Joab was like, um, why did you set my field on fire? And he's like, because I've been trying to reach you. Hello. Like, get me to the king. So he's like, okay, yes, let, let me do this before you burn anything else down. So he brings him to the king. The king kind of gives him like a kiss, and it doesn't say there's any dialogue. Like, there's nothing. Like, you can tell in the next events, Absalom was not resolved because he was like, Okay, and then immediately in chapter 15, this is when Absalom starts winning over the hearts of the people. So he starts doing this little sneak, sneak thing against David because David was well-loved at this point, right? Like everyone wanted him to be king of Israel after Saul's death pretty much um, unanimously. So Absalom starts kind of like undermining him and being like, man, you know, you, you poor, you normal people, like you guys have a lot of issues and David just doesn't have time to listen. But you know who has time to listen? Uh, you know, Absalom, I have time to listen. I love you. So he turns the hearts of the people. And, like, reading through this as a young child or younger, um, I kind of thought, oh, this happened, like, in a week. It was 40 years later, Absalom's like, it's go time. Let's overthrow the government. Let's overthrow my dad. And that's when things start to get really bloody. Well, the overthrowing happened 40 years later, but he was planting seeds. Oh, yes. I'm sure he was feeding into those people the entire time. Uh, the, the demonic issue here... And, and literally, it, it's Absalom submitting so hard. And you see this. David's called by God to be king. And that Satan cannot stand someone being called in a place. Right. And I think Satan's goal was never 
to bring this horrible tragedy to Tamar. Sure. His goal was never to have Amnon destroyed. His goal was never even to bring all this destruction on Absalom. His goal was to get David out of the place Mm -hmm. of his calling. And you see him working and working and working, and still, when David is still in in battle, David tells the man, he said, listen, 20,000 people die in this battle, by the way. David says, when you go out against battle against Absalom and his army, do not put harm to Absalom. He tells his generals that. And this is and think of this. Absalom's no longer a kid. He's not looking at me to, you know, a three year old care anymore. Mm-hmm. He's looking at an older dude that's there to kill him. The older dude that's trying to destroy his kingdom, an older dude that's trying to take so many lives. And the generals are like, What? <laughs> right. So of course they go out. Um, tell us this sad story. This is horrible. Um, so there's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of David fleeing for his life, which is kind of like a throwback, you know, where he was fleeing from Saul. It's like, wait a minute. I think I've seen this one before, but so he's fleeing from his own son. Um, he takes him in his house and he goes through, he has a couple allies. He has a couple people try to kill him. Uh, this one guy, um, Shimei, Shimei, I'm sorry. I'm very bad with pronunciation, but, um, tries to kill him. And so people are like, get him, kill him. You know, David, rise up. You're mighty. And there's a verse where he says, um, basically, you know, Absalom is trying to kill me. Why would this guy be able to do it? You know, the Lord has bidden him. That's verse 11 of chapter 16, by the way. So he's going through. So um, Absalom has some counsel. And there's one gentleman whose name I did try to practice pronouncing. I think it's Ahithophel. So it says a couple times that his word was like unto God's word. Like he had like super wise counsel um, for everyone. Like everyone took his word as like life, right? So he worked for David. Well, they find out, they tell David, they're like, hey, you know that guy, uh, he works for Absalom now. And David's like, oh my goodness. So he prays this really weird prayer where he's like, let his words be like foolishness. So, I mean, that was a pretty brazen prayer but it ends up being true he like brings all this stuff upon Absalom and Absalom's like okay maybe I'm gonna like start trusting this other guy a little bit more so he does he takes counsel and this gentleman actually ends up hanging himself because he's like oh snap like I just realized Absalom is not gonna win this and David's gonna be king and David is gonna have me killed for this like it's treason I've you know participated so unfortunately he ends up taking his own life so in all this um, Absalom is riding on mules, which, um, history fact, a lot of royalty, they would ride on mules. Like, that was their choice, right? You don't think of it as that today. No, when I think of mules, I think of, like, workhorses. Workhorses. Like. <laughs> they are pretty. I love their big heads. So he's on a mule. I had explained to the kids in Sunday school class, if you've never ridden, like, a horse, a mule, whatever, um, a lot of times, I'm sorry, equestrian people, they're selfish. So if you're riding under a tree with low branches, They'll duck their heads and be like, forget the guy on my back. Like, he's dead to me. Like, forget it. Like, they will take you under all sorts of brush and everything, unless you train them to do otherwise. Ask me how I know. Anyway, so he was on his mule. Well, his mule kind of comes under this low-hanging oak. And, you know, that lovely five pounds of hair that Absalom be growing every year, it gets stuck in the oak branches. And the mule just keeps going. So he's just hanging there, and the scripture said he was hanging between heaven and earth. And Micah's dad has a very intense message on hanging in the balance between heaven and earth. It's very, very, very solemn. But this is where Absalom is. So they hear this, and, you know, uh, they go out there, and they're like, listen, we're, we're told not to kill him. And I, was it Joab who was like, yeah, forget that. Like, I'm going to kill him. Uh-huh. Takes three darts, throws him into his heart while he's hanging there alive, which I can't imagine how fearful that would be. Like, you're just hanging there, totally vulnerable, no weapon, whatever. And so they ultimately kill Absalom. And David is tore up about this. David's to the point um, of mourning to where the, the king's guard comes in. The guy's like, listen, here's what you need to understand. You're mourning the man that tried to kill you and tried to kill all your servants. So when you lay in here and groan and cry in this morning, you're telling all of us we're nothing. We're mincemeat. Mm-hmm. So he tells, he shakes David. He says, David, you need to straighten your shoulders, and you need to go out there and do a speech. And you need to tell these people you like these people. <laughs> so David straightens up. David goes out and does that. And this is a story of rebellion. 
And we see over and over and over again how rebellion has consequence. And we talk about the rebellious youth. Rebellion is one of those things, if we allow it in our lives, it'll follow us forever. Mm -hmm. Rebellion is one of those things. It's not a thing of youth like we say, oh, there's a rebellious child. It's a church saying, you know, like there's a rebellious kid. Rebellion can follow you if you don't get rid of it. Mm-hmm. It's just it's one of those things we're supposed to learn a lesson as our youth and shake it off. Uh, Adam and Eve they went through rebellion, and we saw what happened to them. Israelites the rebellion. Um, ah, my goodness, absent is a terrible one. We're going to go into Second Kings pretty soon, and they learn a very very good consequence of this. So Solomon has another brother who's like, okay, I'm going to upseed, I'm going to take your kingship, and Solomon says, no, you're dead. <laughs> And Solomon just ends the whole thing. 20,000 people don't have to die. 20,000 families aren't missing someone in their life. Solomon just ends it. And we've got to learn in our lives, when you're feeling a rebellion in your life, you're feeling something that's coming against, if there's a young person watching this right now and you're going through that, I just don't understand why we did this. I don't understand why mom is limiting this. I don't understand why dad's saying this. I don't understand why the Bible won't allow this. God isn't doing this stuff with an iron fist to stop you. God is trying to protect you. Mm-hmm. And we see over and over God's protection. And God God is so forgiven of mistakes. And God's so forgiven of issues. And God's so forgiven of our problems. But on earth, there is consequences for some of this stuff. And we see this here. Absolutely. It's a sad but true statement. I mean. Absalom was the father of peace. Mm-hmm. Absalom should have died being second in command to Solomon. Absalom should have died being a genius. Absalom should have died being worth... I mean, if he's in the same family as Solomon, what are they saying? Like a trillion and a half dollars, half, a little bit of that wealth would have been poured on him. Absalom should have died in a huge palace. Absalom should have died an old man, happy in a kingdom with his brother and his family. But Absalom died covered in rocks and was buried in a ditch. Mm-hmm. That's terrible. It's terrible. It was not. It was not the life and life more abundantly that God had for him. No, he definitely let the enemy win out in his life and like. Like you said, we see the consequences of that, of a life lived. I mean, he lived most of his life like this, and it was just so unnecessary. It was so needless. Coming to a close here, I ask you to please take a moment, um, like this, and share this with your friends. Next week, we're going to be in 20 going mm-hmm. forward. I think we're going to finish out Second Samuel next week. So. Oh, my goodness. Well, we are finishing out 2 <laughs> Samuel next week. Okay, so, yeah, tune in with us then. Also, uh, if you haven't subscribed to this already, when you – do go we'll put a link in the description for the magazine you will not be getting this magazine you're going to be getting the next issue so the fall edition is coming out very very soon so excited about that it is a beautiful beautiful looking magazine plus i like fall yes pumpkin pie definitely thank you so much god bless you god bless you